Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. This morning we're going to be looking at Philemon uh, verse 1. And Paul says here, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Now you wouldn't think this introduction would have a lot in it. But what I'm going to speak on to you this morning is the very first couple words. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And you'd be surprised what we're going to get out of that today. This is the only epistle. Now what we call the epistles are the, the books in the Bible that Paul wrote. Okay, uh, This is the only epistle which refers he refers to himself as the prisoner of Jesus Christ. In seven of the epistles, he calls himself an apostle. In three of them, he refers to himself as a Christian servant or Christ servant. And in two of them, he says nothing about himself whatsoever. This is the only one he calls himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ. And it's an interesting statement. And we're going to look at that this morning. Paul, with his relationship with God, thinks of himself as a prisoner doing the bidding of his God. And the best part of all this is that he's happy in where he's at and what he's doing. And the place where God would have him to be. And we're going to examine that this morning. So point number one, and by the way, some of my points are going to overlap each other. But point number one is Paul is not complaining about being a prisoner. And I'll explain that. Two things are happening here. He's actually in prison while he's writing this. And now he's calling himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and he's using this as an illustration. And what's happening is, in a nutshell, the book of Philemon is Paul writing this letter to Philemon that, uh, that he actually led to the Lord many, a long time before that. But he's writing him a letter because one of Philemon's slaves ran away. And his slave, if I pronounce his name properly, I, I have a problem with this, Onesimus. Okay, and what happens is after he ran away, eventually he gets saved. And Paul now is addressing this letter to Philemon and saying, listen, I want you to forgive and to forget and welcome him back. I want to send him back to you. Because generally when sl slaves in those days ran away, they would get uh, either crucified or whipped or whatever, and it wasn't a good thing at all. But you remember, Philemon's saved too. And if you read the book of Philemon, which isn't a long book, it's not even got chapters in it, it's just one book, short book. But you'll see that Paul talks about a lot of different things and why he should take him back. And, all. and Philemon's a pretty good, uh, he's close to the Lord in himself. So, now, while he's writing this book, he's in Rome. He's in prison in Rome. And he's in prison for approximately two years. Paul's in this prison. And yet he's here for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's in prison for. Does this stop him from doing what God would have him to do? Not at all. Doesn't even slow him down. And we're going to learn about that this morning. Doesn't even slow him down. Paul truly learned to whatever state he's in, wherever he's at, to be content with the Lord. And we're going to discuss that this morning. Doesn't even slow him down. Paul takes advantage of the situation. And now, I didn't take the time to read how many uh, books of the Bible he actually wrote, but he wrote several, a uh, Fleeman being one of them, while he was in the prison. Now, he went from one area to prison, I think when he first got there, to where they uh, have what we determine house arrest, I guess you might call it, where he was in the upper area in, in the palace under a guard every day. And what I read in previous studies, uh, when I did a study with Paul, that he actually had different guards all day long. You know, had shifts, not the same guard day and night. He had a guard with him every moment, a Roman guard. And he would actually witness to them too. Paul never stopped serving God no matter what situation he was in. And that's part of what we need to understand here. When he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, he meant that he was in the control of God every single moment. 
and he used every single moment. He didn't boo-hoo because he was in prison. He didn't boo-hoo because he was, you know, couldn't leave and do what he want and go back out. He was unfairly judged in what he did. He never really did anything against the Pharisees that brought the charges against him. You know, and actually he would have been set free had he appealed to Caesar, but uh, he had appealed to Caesar because he was born a Roman citizen. You could do it two ways. You could buy yourself into citizenship back then with money, or you could be freeborn. Paul was freeborn. Made him a very special person. That's why they put him up, in, in, uh, up into the palace later, because of those statements. So we got Onesimus, uh, you know, becoming a Christian, and Paul, again, wants to send him back. So because he was a runaway slave, Paul writes this letter to try to get Philemon to take him back without no punishment, no nothing. Now, point number two, Paul is proud that he is a prisoner. He is a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and he's here in prison because of Christ. Paul is describing himself as a bondsman of Christ. Uh, he's describing himself that I'm a servant of Christ. He's saying I'm a slave of Christ. All these words mean something more than just being saved. He has totally committed himself to serving the God as we as Christians should be. You don't have to be apostle to do all this. But Christ, doing Christ's will and not his own is what he's looking to do. Now, he does not mind being a prisoner for Christ. If you're going to be a prisoner of someone, Christ would be the one you want. <laughs> I mean, if you read some of the examples in the Word of God, some of these prisons were terrible. I mean, nothing compared. What we have today in the worst case scenario is like being in a nice hotel of Holiday Inn compared to what they would have to go through. Most prisons were down below the palaces and uh, whatever, in dungeons. Um, they, a lot of times they were lowered down, total darkness in there. And when they got down in there, it was anywhere from six inches to whatever, uh, mud. It wasn't even a dry floor. It was wet. And, uh, and that's how they lived. And I don't know if you've ever read things of history. Some people in history, not Christians, but just people in history, that went into prisons, ended up dying there, not because they were not healthy when they went in it, because the environment they were living in there killed them themselves. You know, so prison wasn't an easy thing, but yet Paul was content to whatever state he was there in. He was always making the best of every situation he did. And think about this. I got to thinking about this. What a perfect place to be in house arrest to write the books of the Bible. He couldn't be out in the churches doing. Now, he had visitors and he had people come and visit him. That wasn't a problem while he was there. But he couldn't run out and do anything. He was always in the house arrest. But you talk about a time, if you're going to write something, this would be the perfect time. This is just my opinion. But it just, to me, shows how God works in our lives when we might be boohooing because we're in prison. Oh, man, I'm here. I can't be out doing what I want to do. I can't. And he didn't know how long he was going to be there, by the way. This wasn't like, oh, you got a two-year sentence. Serve it. He didn't know how long he was going to be in there. It ended up being two years. But we have a tendency every time something happens to us in our life that we're boohooing about everything. Why do I have to go through this? I just left one, now I'm in another one. And Paul never looked at it that way, ever in his life, no matter what happened. He made always the best of the situation he was in. And he was in situations far worse than we ever going to be in. The joy of knowing that Christ was there no matter what problem arise, arose that he was going to be taken care of because he trusted his Savior. Which leads to our third point. Paul knows that he's in a place where Christ wants him to be. Paul knows that even in suffering, he's in God's will. Sometimes when we suffer, we think, you know, that we, we don't dwell on God. We don't dwell on, we're worried more about our financial need or 
family problems or or whatever and we don't look at it as a way of God using this situation to help us grow as Christians. Paul looked at it as a positive thing and we'll look at that in just a moment a little bit more. He knows whatever problem comes his way God will be there to help work it out and he's totally confident of it. I was just reading this morning where uh, Christ you know, uh, they, he got the disciples to go out onto the boat, onto the sea, Galilee, and he comes uh, walking, you know, on the water, and they think it's a ghost and all, and he comes to see when he gets on the boat. You know, well, first of all, Peter wanted to walk out and all. That was one situation. And then Paul, t uh, Peter took his eyes off and looked at the wave and went, oh no, this wave is going to hit me, and he lost faith. And Christ says, why did you look, turn, take your eyes off of me? It was a perfect example of we as Christians. We've got to keep the eyes on Christ. The moment we start looking at the problem and not at Christ, we're going to start sinking. But then there's another instance where he's sleeping in the boat. And the waves and storms came up. And the boat's sinking. It's actually taking on water. And Christ is sitting there sleeping. They had to wake him up. Don't you care about us? We're dying here. And he says, oh, ye of little faith, I'm here. And then he rebukes the wind and, all, and it calmed down. And they went, stood back and went, whoa. Even the winds and the sea. It just amazed me. I don't know if you've ever done this but or if you've wondered. But all through the time, Christ, the disciples were with Christ. And he's going through. A lot of the times they never truly comprehended what he was doing. For instance, he did the feeding of the, you know, 5,000. They always get mixed up which one was first, the 5,000 or four. But anyhow, uh, he feeds, let's just say 5,000 to start off with. Then later on, they're back with the 4,000. And the first thing the disciples said, whoa, we don't have anything. It was like, did you not remember what I just did back there? And you don't you think I can do it again? It was like sometimes they just never truly understood. That's why it's so important for us to be in the Word, to be here, constantly learning, and don't miss anything. Because the moment you miss something, you miss something that would have been a message from you from God to help you deal with your everyday problems. It's not because you have to have a 100% thing with me or with State Line Motorcycle Ministry. It's all about you. Even Paul says in his epistles, that uh, when they were giving him money, he says, listen man, it's not that I have want of money that I'm bringing this to you. It's because I want you to be blessed. God says he will bless you and I want to see you be blessed when you give. It was never the money for him. It was to see the blessings of the person given. And you know what's really neat? He's in prison, he's caught up doing all this, and he's as happy as he could be, as if he was out of prison. And he's conducting business every day, and he's happy to be in the will of God. Never looking at it as a negative, but as a positive. Now, look at, turn to Philippians chapter 4. I can prove what I'm saying, biblically. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul saying here now, Not that I re speak in respect of want. So he's never complaining about wanting something. He says, For I have learned, in whatever state I am therewith, to be content. He has learned that it doesn't matter whether I have food today or not, I know my God will supply my needs. As he tells us in, in the uh, epistles, I mean in the uh, uh, gospels. He just learned this lesson, and he applies it every day. He doesn't let not having food one day surprise him, or not having the money he thought he had, and, and he didn't have it. He knows God will work it out. He doesn't know how, but he does, and he prays to God and believes in that. Then look what he says. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things, there was no exception to this now, okay? In all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to be abound and to suffer. He didn't... Hey, no one wants to be, how would you say, punished with the whips and all that stuff which they used back then. 
But you know what? He turned around and would say, I count it a blessing to suffer for God. Even Stephen had to think a minute. They got stoned to death. During the time he's being stoned. Now how would you like to be stoned to death? Throwing stones at you until you're dead. That cannot be an easy way of dying. And yet he's praying to God while he's being stoned. Tell him to forgive them for what they're doing. And at the same time he saw in heaven. What was taking place. That's the type of attitude we need to have. And here's what's really neat. He ends the statement in verse 13. And he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. See, that's his mindset. I can be in prison and I can write the Bible. Now, he didn't know it was going to be the Bible at that moment. But look how God used him because of his mindset. And God can use each of us in that type of mindset. That's why I stress the attendance and being here and learning and, and especially when we do have our Bible studies to open and, and ask questions and all. This, during the preaching, we don't do that, but during the Bible study, open up and, and talk. We may, I don't know, and maybe in the future we may start doing it weekly. I don't know. I would prefer back getting back and doing it weekly, but we'll discuss that as a group next time we meet. Paul does not complain when things don't go his way. He looks at it as, <clears throat> as an opportunity. Why? Because he never forgets who's in charge. The God who made all things, who can do anything. You know, we can make things from something. We can take metal out of the ground and form it and make a pistol, a house, buildings, furniture, cars, bikes. But God can make something from nothing. That's called creation. We forget sometimes who we're serving. You have not because you ask not or you ask amiss. When you're in God's will, you will be asking the proper things. You won't be asking stupid things when you're in the will of God. That's the key. See, a lot of people say, well, that means I can ask for a Lamborghini rather than a, than a, a Chevy. Well, if you're in the will of God, you would never even consider asking for a Lamborghini. But you know, the neatest thing I've found in the past is sometimes God gives you a, a Lamborghini <laughs> without asking. I told, you know, I was with a lot of preachers this last week. And we would talk about different things. And they, st and they have a problem with the, with the prosperity preaching too, just like I do. But yet, at the same time, and I said this to everybody there, I said, you know, but you still can't stop preaching because, about it because if you are truly doing it for the right reason, trying to be close to God, He will bless you. I've seen it. I'm a perfect testimony of it. But if you're going there for the reason to be blessed, it doesn't work that way. And that's why I don't like prosperity preaching. Because they're saying, oh, God will make you a million. Or God will do this and God will do that. And the people are going there for the wrong reason. And then when it doesn't happen, they get back. They get depressed. Well, the preacher told me that. The man of God said that. Paul knew that he could get victory in all things as long as it was through Christ. It was never about himself. It was always knowing where to tap in for the power. You know Paul is praying to his God and looking each day and every day to God. And he's a prayer warrior. We have in, in, uh, in the Gospels and all, we have where Christ went off and prayed. One of my other things I read the other day, Christ left after teaching. He sent the disciples away on the boat and then he went up into a mountain and it said he prayed all night. How many of us have ever went up and prayed for four hours, five hours? Christ, God in the flesh had to do it. I would think we'd have to do more. <laughs> but there are times when we need to get down and do some serious praying about things with God and get our lives straightened out. It's not about family. It's not about jobs. It's not about anything. 
It's what it is. It's about God's relationship. And then, when that's right, the family, the jobs, and everything else come into line. What the problem is, we put the wrong things ahead of God. Now, let me tell you how Paul's thinking here about being a prisoner. Did the Romans put him in prison? Nope. Did the religious rulers who brought charges against him initiate putting him in prison? Nope. Jesus Christ let them put him in prison. Now remember in James it says God is not the author of evil. And let me clarify that again, how this works. God does not create evil and bring it into our lives. But what he does do is let evil come into our lives. There's a big difference between the two. Job is a great example. Satan comes up to heaven. God brags about Job. But then, what does Satan do? Well, you're protecting him. You won't let me get close to him. He says, okay, I will let you get so close. Then he came up a second time. I'll let you get a little close. But see, he never created the situation. He only permits it. There's a big difference. That's what God does to us in our life. He will permit things to come into us. Why? To test us. Do you really believe what you're telling everybody you believe? Do you really love me? I'm going to find out, just like he did with Abraham. It shows all through the Word of God. We've been through that. Look what he, what, what's being said here in John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Now, there's some powerful words there. I cannot of my own self do nothing. I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. That's what we should have as our prayers. This is why Paul is looking at the whole thing in a different perspective than we would. He's looking at it as a positive thing in his life. It's no big deal. Do you think he wanted to be in prison? I don't think he wanted to be, but he made the best of it, and he made it enjoyable. To the point to where he says, Hey man, Philemon, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he's proud of it. The same way Christ looked at the Father is the way Paul looked towards God. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and enjoying every minute of it. Making the best of everything. And remember, prison wasn't the way it is today. So Paul had a lot to be thankful for being in the worst possible situation. So what lessons are here for us to learn? I want to challenge you today to be a prisoner for Jesus Christ. To be a real prisoner for Jesus Christ. Don't say it by words. Say it by deed. I'll tell you something that was a big... Uh, as we were talking, you know, there was a lot of preachers there... And I was telling people, they were asking me about the ministry and all, and, I, and, and this is what I have found, and I think most of you may know this anyhow. People are tired of hearing people preach at them. Preaching to the unsaved and all, we go to the abate meeting. They're tired of being preached at. What they want to see is a real Christian. Show me this real Christian that the Bible talks about. Because everybody I see as a Christian isn't living the Christian life, and they don't know nothing about the Bible. And they have higher standards than we have. They want to see a real Christian. And they're the, the person that's acting and living a Christian life, they're the ones that are going to get people to come to know Christ. And it may not be the next day. I remember uh, Cowboy down in Daytona, uh, Don, four years before he accepted Christ. But he eventually accepted Christ. And we have people in the ABAP meeting that need Jesus Christ. Members that may not even be there today that need Christ. Or the toy runs, we're going to meet people. Now, we may not be able to lead them to Christ that first time or nothing else. But just being around them. I'll never forget... Uh, 
uh, <laughs> the Reeds, K, Scott, Scott and K Reeds. When I when I finally got fed up with asking them to come to one of our service, five years I asked them. Not every time I met them, but occasionally I finally decided. You know, I don't want to bug them. Obviously, after five years, if they haven't showed up, they probably not going to come. So I decided, I got Scott to the side one day, and I said, Scott, it's some poker run or whatever. And I said, you know, I've decided I'm not going to ask you anymore to come to the service. He says, why? I said, well, it's been five years and you haven't come. I, I, I realize I'm getting a hint you don't want to come anyhow. And you know what he said to me? He turned around and said, Glenn, please don't stop asking. And I, oh, now I'm really scratching my head. I said, are you serious? He says, yeah, please don't. And with less than a month later, they started coming. They got right with the Lord. Uh, they professed to know the Lord. I just questioned them. They seemed to know Christ, but they were totally out of fellowship, and they started getting back in and grew and everything else. And well, Anyhow, it just blew me away. So, see, it taught me lessons. You don't bug them. You don't push them. But yet, you never give up. You never give up. Let's pray. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.